Welcome to this next webinar called the Multifamily Investor Nation webinar series. I'm your host, Dan Hanford. I'm one of the managing partners of a uh, private equity real estate firm acquiring multifamily assets across the Southeast. And we are, you can visit us at passiveinvesting.com. When you go to the passiveinvesting.com page, you will see on the top right hand corner, there's a button to join the Passive Investor Club. So if you're interested in joining one of joining us on one of our future acquisitions, we have several LOIs out right now. We'll hopefully have a deal locked up very soon. So if you want to join us on one of our future acquisitions, you can certainly go to PassiveInvesting.com and join us there for the next uh, acquisition that we have. I also want to mention to you before we get started on this webinar that you can visit us for our next Multifamily Investor Nation Summit. So we have an, a summit coming up in June, June 2021, June 10th, 11th, and 12th. And so you can go to uh, the MFINsummit.com to be able to register for the next summit that is coming up. So make sure you do that right now. Go check it out. Looking forward to having you with us at that event. It's all online. It's all virtual. And no, we have not been doing virtual just because of COVID. We have never done a live in-person event. It's always been a live online virtual event. And you can, this will be our sixth one that we have done. And so you can visit us there at MFINsummit.com to register. Tickets are on sale now. And let's see, today we're going to be talking about no money down, how to acquire your first multifamily asset without using any of your own money. And so let's go ahead and dive into this topic about how to use how to, how to use other people's money and how to acquire an asset with no money down. So we've all heard TV commercials and infomercials and things like that, that tout being able to buy a property with no money down. But when it comes to multifamily, it's really kind of a misnomer. It's not really no money down. You can kind of maybe think of it and say, none of your own money down. If you wanted to do a syndication or bring on other private investors, you could do, you can do it that way, right? Now, one of the things that I recommend and what we do with our group is that whenever you're raising money from investors, you should have skin in the game. It's one of the red flags that I talk about. I actually wrote an article recently where my wife and I have invested in 38 different um, LP positions with about 14 different operators across the country where we place our own family's capital inside of various assets. And one of the things that we did, we, we sat down and we said, what are some things that we just will not invest in? What are, the, what are those red flags from an operator that if we see it inside of an operator that we walk away, right? These aren't yellow flags. These are true red flags, right? And so I wrote an article on that. You can go to our website, passiveinvesting.com in the Knowledge Center. You can look in there. It's You can just type in the, in the search box in the Knowledge Center, red flags, and you will find that article. And for those of you who are watching live, Melissa will also type into the chat box there a link to that article if you wanted to get some more information about what those seven red flags are are because it's very good information to have as you're looking to place capital yourself into other LP positions, but also as an active syndicator, when you're starting to put together your own projects and your own deals, these are great red flags to be careful of when you're structuring your own deals because there's a lot of people like myself that will not invest in your asset or your acquisition if one of these seven red flags are present. And it's not looking to see if all seven are there, if one of these seven red flags are present, then we decide to pass on the opportunity and we'll look for the next opportunity because there's plenty of other opportunities that are out there that don't have these red flags in them, which is why we've been able to place our capital with these 38 different LP positions with these 14 different operators. So the uh, the biggest thing I was gonna, I wanna say here is, is that even though you can acquire a property with none of your own money down, make sure that as an operator, you are putting your own money in the, in, in the game, right? You want Investors like to see an operator that has skin in the game. Yes, you might be able to find some investors that are willing to kind of take a flyer on you and, and you put no money in there and maybe they trust you in a different realm, right? Maybe they, they've worked with you in the past. They know you have a great track record and they believe in you. Maybe you'll find that, right? But it's my recommendation that you, if you want to continue to grow and you want to continue to scale, that you need to be able to take it to the, take yourself to the next level by investing your own capital alongside your investors in some of these projects. Because if you believe in it enough, you should be willing to be, to be able to believe in it enough to be able to invest your own capital, right? Now, my, my, my rule of thumb is I want to see at least $100,000 co-investment by the operator in the projects. That's kind of at a minimum. 
what I prefer to see is closer to about a five to 10% um, of range inside of the, each one of the acquisitions. But at a minimum, I do like to see a $100,000 co-investment alongside the operator. Now, the, we're talking about some larger acquisitions, 100 units or more. If you have a smaller acquisition, maybe you're only raising a couple hundred thousand dollars or maybe a couple million, then that's a kind of a smaller acquisition, smaller raise, then you might be able to get away with that. And it's kind of coming in at that, at that five or 10% range where you may be only bringing, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 to the table. Again, that's a conversation that you have to have with yourself, how much money you have to deploy, and also being able to have that conversation to be able to determine at what point are you going to be able to put more money into each one of these acquisitions? But when you're getting started, yes, you can obviously go in there and you can uh, put in uh, your money as much as much money as you can. Now, some people might ask you, well, what about your acquisition fee? What if you're just rolling in the acquisition fee into the investment, right? Well, to me, that's still your own money, right? Because when we close the property, you're going to be taking that money out anyway and put it in your own bank account, whether you are putting money in or not. So I'm not the type that's going to say you have to put in all your acquisition fee plus another 100000 or plus another 5 or 10%, but I want to see at least a 5 to 10% um, or a minimum $100,000 co-investment inside the acquisition, okay? All right, so next question in here, or next kind of topic I wanna to talk about is some strategies for attracting capital to acquire your first property, right? So when you're uh, trying to attract capital, one of the things you have to think about is your investor, right? Because at the end of the day, your investor is your customer. I left my water over here for, give me just a moment. Well, that's kind of a cool effect. If I do this, maybe you can see the background. No, nope, you can't see through it. All right. Well, I thought I'd give it a try. There's no green really on here, I guess, Don. So not a big deal. All right. I guess I could put this over here. I'm trying to figure out the new studio. So give me just a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll get this whole stuff figured out where I want to position things and kind of lay things out and stuff like that eventually. But um, hopefully you guys are enjoying the new studio. I, I know we are enjoying it, trying to get the different technologies put into place and having the different camera angles. I'll tell you what, Don, how about you show them a little bit of the background of the, of the, of the studio and see if we can, do we have this, this, this camera set up? He's going to get a, one of our kind of backup cameras set up so you can actually see what the studio looks like and where I'm sitting in relation to everything else in the studio maybe eventually. Uh, might not be able to do it today. Oh, there we go. So you don't see me, but you see kind of a little bit of a background. <laughs> you kind of key me out a little bit there. Um, but you can kind of see where we are. You know, this is this is the studio. Um, but all right, let's, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a behind the scenes peek. I know you guys are sometimes curious about that. If you're ever in Columbia, South Carolina, let me know. You can come to the studio, take a look at it. Maybe we'll shoot an interview together here in the studio and uh, and uh, kind of put you on the podcast or well, the podcast. Well, it depends on what you want to talk about. So if you have a, a property you want to talk about, then obviously we can do that. Um, if you want to... Uh, you know, go do it, uh, talk about it on our, our on a webinar or a meeting or something like that. We can certainly do that. We have the studio set up here. So we kind of have this kind of newscaster style table we got set up here. We can have a little bit of a dialogue going back and forth. And uh, so if you're in the area, let me know. So strategies for attracting capital. You have to be thinking about your investors, right? Because at the end of the day, in an apartment syndication business, your customer is the investor. Now you might think, well, isn't my customer also the resident? Not necessarily, right? So they're, they are a, a customer, but they're the customer in the apartment building itself, not in the syndication business. There's two different businesses, right? So you're actually starting an apartment syndication business that actually is attracting capital from investors. And then secondarily, you are buying businesses, which is the apartment complex and the residents are your customers. So we're not talking about the residents right now as their customers, we're talking about the investors. And so one of the things that I've always done, which I think is one of the things that has really allowed me to have the success that I have, is I always put myself in the customer's shoes and figure out and see how are they seeing things? How are they perceiving things? And so I try to do that all the time. And even, and, and it's not even just, and it's not even just uh, uh, like inside of the, the syndication business, but when we're talking with a seller, when we're talking with a broker, you put yourself in their shoes and how they're going to perceive what you are saying and it allows you to be able to perfect the conversation that you have, right? And so with investors, you have to be thinking about them. And so when you're thinking about structuring your syndication, you have to think about them, right? You want investors to invest with you on multiple projects. One of the things that I see in this syndication world is there's a lot of people that think that they want to get started and they get started. 
they do their first deal and then they go away. Like you never see them again. Right. And I think it's because they don't have the ability to put systems and procedures and processes in place to be able to grow their syndication business. And they get frustrated with them because they have basically created another job for themselves. And so if you follow us here with the multifamily investor nation, that's one of the things that we try to teach you is how to not have to do everything yourself, right? How to build out your team. That's one of the, one of the key things is, is building a team that's surrounding you so that you can continue to grow and that you can continue to scale. And your investors will expect to see that, right? They want to see that you are growing. They want to be part of something that's at the vision is to be able to be, to grow and to be expand and to be part of something really cool and really big. And of course that has really, really great returns all at the same time. So, when you're trying to attract capital, one of the things that we've done is we've created an authority platform. And of course, the authority platform that we've created is the MFIN group. We do these weekly webinars. So every week we're pushing out content on these webinars. And what we try to do is we try to pick topics that are, that are easy for us to be able to talk about. And the way we get our topics is we have a quarterly brainstorming session for about an hour where we sit down and we open up multifamily books so we'll open up a lot of these different books. We'll go through the table of contents and go, what are some topics that, that we feel like we would be good for us to talk about? And as you can see, we come up with various, uh, uh, you know, uh, three or four different kind of questions or things that we can cover. And that allows us to be able to cover a good 20 to 30 to sometimes 45 minute webinar to be able to continue to be able to provide some content and some education. And so building an authority platform will allow you to be able to, you know, find some investors. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, but if I do that, am I not also trying to just like teach other multifamily investors how to do what I'm doing? And the answer to that question is yes. But what we have found is that there's a lot of investors that think that they want to get into multifamily and do it full time. And then when they start learning from us and being educated by us, they realize, wow, this is actually a lot of work. I don't want to do all of that. All I want to do is just invest my money and let, let, let it cash flow. And so that's what they do. They get to the point of you know finding us here on the MFIN and going, you know what? This is a lot of work. I don't want to deal with all of that. Here's my money. You do it. And then, of course, they become a passive investor and achieve some really great returns, right? And they go to our website, passiveinvesting.com. They fill out the investor form. And they're, they're on our investor list for future acquisitions and ready to invest in the next opportunity, right? Now, there's also active syndicators that join us on these, pro, on, these, on these. And I would say the majority of the people that join us are active syndicators. But we also get investments from active syndicators and actually some pretty well-known syndicators that multiple ones that have invested alongside us in our properties. And it's because of the credibility that we provide and a lot of the content that we push out. So we're always out there and in front of the multifamily space and the multifamily world, and we're not going anywhere, right? We're going to continue to push out content. And so you might be thinking, well, why does a multifamily invest a syndicator invest with you? Well, a lot of times they might have some stagnant capital that's sitting on the sidelines that they want to put to work and diversify their portfolio that maybe they don't have another deal yet for their own group. Or a lot of them have invested with their 401k or their IRA because they can't invest in their own properties with their 401k or their IRA. So they can do a self-directed IRA or a self-directed 401k. And when they do that, they can now invest alongside us and some of our active syndications and continue to grow their portfolio and still do what they teach investors is to invest their self-directed retirement accounts inside of these multifamily assets and these multifamily acquisitions. So those, that's, that's, that's one way, right? Building that, afford, that authority platform. Of course, there's other ways to meet investors, going and actually go, um, you know, going to various meetup groups. Right now, meetup groups are starting to pick back up. Well, actually, the multifamily investor nation, we have uh, 53 meetup groups that are hosted throughout the country. And some of our co-organizers, some of our groups don't have any co-organizers. So if you're some reason you wanna join us and, and participate as a co-organizer and get some additional education that we don't charge for, there's no charge to be a co-organizer, but you could be a co-organizer in some of these local markets. And uh, you can actually go to meetup.com and type in multifamily investor nation and you will see our page out there and, uh, and Melissa might be able to find it and type it for those of you who are joining us live if, uh, if you do be able to go straight to the multifamily investor nation meetup page where you can find a group that is near your area and you could reach out to people in that group so that you can continue to further the conversation and meet some other investors now one of the key things that I like to do is find an investor that is not 
in the same room as a bunch of other investors that are looking for the same type of person, right? So I like to go to other, other types of events like business networking events and executive events. And even going to events like, uh, like, like, uh, like uh, for example, if you're in the medical space, go to medical events like these, these surgeon events and these primary doctor events and these orthopedic surgeon events. And go, to, go to places where you know there are high net worth individuals in the room. Buy a booth, set up a booth and actually find and then talk to people about what you're doing. So then the next topic we're going to talk about here is, is should you raise capital from family and friends, right? And family and friends are the types of investors that I would probably say the friends, yes. I've, I've got quite a number of our friends that have invested with us on our properties. As a matter of fact, I have several of our friends that are on this webinar right now watching and learning about multifamily syndication. The The second thing is, is even uh, uh, I'm going... So the, the, as far as the family is concerned, I really don't have a lot of family that has invested in our properties. So I, I have mostly it's probably because I don't have a lot of family members that have the high net worth a, a classification to be able to be classified as an accredited investor, to be able to invest alongside of some of our assets. And you might be sitting there thinking, thinking the same thing, right? Because as the operator, because you are an officer or a director in the company, you yourself don't have to be a accredited investor, but you can lead a syndication group and put together a, put together a fund and be able to uh, raise money for a property. But maybe your family don't, or they don't really fit into that category. That's kind of where my family is. They're not in that category to be able to invest alongside us. And even when we do a 506 Bravo, which we're going to talk about the 506 Bravo versus the 506 Charlie in just a moment here. But in the 506 Bravo, you can bring in some of your non-accredited investors. But even then, that my family doesn't have the money to be able to do that, right? And so I haven't really found a lot of you know, opportunity and potential for family to invest. Now, that doesn't mean that you, do, you can't find family members, right? But if like I was actually, I just did an interview on a podcast. His name is Chance Ireland just before this interview or this, this webinar and his, his episode will be releasing here in the next couple of weeks on the uh, MFIN podcast about how he acquired a 24 unit property out of Springfield, Illinois. And the way he was able to buy that property is number one, he actually um, is 1031 exchanging some proceeds where he bought when he was 21 years old, a three unit tri triplex that he is 1031 exchanging some money into that acquisition. And then he brought on some family members to be able to take down the last little hundred thousand that needed to be needed to be invested in that property that he was acquiring. So there are opportunities out there for some of you who have family members that do have some uh, deep pockets, if you will, or are accredited investors. And you just have to start having that conversation. So I'm not opposed to it, but number one, make sure that before you raise money from anybody, whether it be family, friends, or even these just accredited investors that aren't necessarily, quote unquote, your prior family and friends, before you raise money from those people, make sure that you are confident with your acquisition process. Make sure you are confident with your, uh, with your, with your, not even just your acquisition process, but make sure that you are confident with the assets that you are buying and the returns that you are projecting and the underwriting and the due diligence and making sure that you are bringing people into an asset that is going to actually perform the way you project, right? Because at the end of the day, yes, these are investments and yes, they don't always turn out the same way that you project, but you want to have a nice diversification and make sure that the majority of your acquisitions are, are performing and are doing really well, right? All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about today are these SEC rules and regulations surrounding these, uh, these, these types of securities. So we're going to be, uh, there's actually two people in here that mentioned, Alan saying family office events are also good places to find some high net worth individuals. And then also the New Orleans Investment Conference. So haven't heard of that one before, the New Orleans Investment Conference, but that might be a good one for you to look up. I'm actually going to be in Houston later this week. I'm actually flying out on um, Friday around 11 or 12 o'clock, somewhere around in there. I'm going to be going to Houston and uh, speaking at a conference out there in Houston. So it's actually sold out. So if you haven't registered for it yet, you know, there's no sense in me telling you about it because it's it's sold out. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it actually, because of COVID, they limited it to 300 investors and they did sell out that event. So, all right, let's see. 
somebody's saying, Freddie's asking, is that Fuji water? Uh, what is that Fuji water paying for the free promo? <laughs> no, it's not. But uh, I, I actually I do like the the Fiji water. So maybe I should uh, contact Fiji to try to get some extra uh, uh, funds or proceeds for for drinking their water on the air. What I should do is just get a little wrap and wrap it with uh, you know passiveinvesting.com so you can uh, you know get some promotional material there, or get some of those drinks or whatever. Anyway, Melissa says she's on it, so she's she's working on that for us to get a little wrap for our water so we can st stop promoting Fiji and start promoting our you know what you call it our passiveinvesting.com faux water our Fiji faux water I guess. Last question here that we're going to cover today before we open up for questions. And so if you have questions today, make sure that you type them into the chat box. So type them into the chat box and let us know city and state of where you, city and state, <laughs> I'm getting myself mixed up a little bit here. So what I would like for you to do is, uh, if you have questions in the chat box, type those questions into the chat box and we can further uh, do that for you. I have somebody trying to call me on team. So let me disconnect that as well. So the SEC rules and regulations surrounding selling these types of securities. So if you're going to be going after any type of acquisition and you're bringing on investors that are doing nothing other than just bringing equity to the table, that is considered a security. And so when you when it's considered a security, you now have the rules and regulations of the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the United States to deal with. That's the SEC. And one of the things that you don't realize is that every state also has their own SEC uh, board as well, or department. And so you have to make sure you're complying with both of them. Most of the time, the, the federal SEC will supersede most of those rules that are that are located there. But again, I'm not an attorney. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't, I don't practice law and, and don't do securities law or anything like that. So definitely would highly recommend you when you're getting started with your syndication business to reach out to a securities attorney Make sure you're doing things the right way. The attorney that we use is Dugan Kelly. He's actually out of Texas. So if you go to Google and just type in Dugan Kelly, uh, real estate attorney or whatever, he can do both the transactional side of the real estate transaction anywhere in the country. And he can also do the security side of things. So we use him for our security side of things um, for our stuff as well. All right. So with the securities, there are two different registrations that will be most common when it comes to these types of acquisitions. So you're going to either see a 506 Bravo or a 506 Charlie. And these are all under Regulation D with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And there's a couple of different nuances between the 506 B and C that you have to be aware of. So when you're first getting started, most people do a 506 B because that's where you can bring on family, friends, and other people that you have a prior existing relationship with. So in order to do a 506 Bravo, you have to have that established prior existing substantive relationship with that investor before you bring them onto your deal, right? And so you have to have conversations with them. You have to have multiple encounters with them. And there's no real like hard and fast rule, but you have to have multiple contacts. You can establish that, 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 that relationship with them prior to putting the deal under contract. So you can't put a deal under contract and go, oh, I need to go find investors, right? This is why I always tell you, go find investors now. Don't be looking for the deal and not finding investors. In the syndication business, you have to always be doing both. You have to be finding deals and you also have to be finding investors all at the same time. So make sure that you are always looking for both. But in a 506 Bravo, that's when you can bring in family, friends, and other people that you have a prior existing relationship with. You can have unlimited amounts of accredited investors inside of these assets. The accredited investors inside of the 506 Bravo does not have to go through a third-party accreditation service like verifyinvestor.com to be able to verify by a third party that they are actually an accredited investor. You, they, they will basically, when they're signing their documents to sign up for the, for the offering, they will sign a document that states that they are self-attesting that they are an accredited investor and they meet the definition based on those securities guidelines. Now, the, to be an accredited investor, there are multiple ways, but there are two common ways that most people will fit in. And if you want to find more information about the expanded definition of an accredited investor, 
you can actually go to uh, Google and just type in SEC accredited investor expanded definition. And they've recently expanded that, but most people still don't qualify under those guidelines. But there are some additional ways that you can do that. The two common ways is that is to qualify as an accredited investor, you have to either meet the income or net worth requirements. So you have to have at least a net worth of $1 million that does not include your primary residence, or you have to have a uh, income, an, an annual income of $200,000 or $300,000 if you are married. So single is $200,000, $300,000 if you are married for the last two years, and you have a reasonable expectation for that, for that to continue, right? So those are the two, one or the other, that you have to meet to become an accredited investor in the eyes of the Securities and Exchange Commission. But if you are a non-accredited investor in a 506 Bravo, you can accept as an operator up to 35 non-accredited investors. And so there are opportunities for non-accredited investors to be able to invest in these types of assets. Most people, I would say, when they first get started, do a 506 Bravo. And then eventually, as they build up their investor base, and they build up their brand awareness, and they want to market more, they can go into a 506 Charlie. Because that's one of the other main distinctions is that in a 506 Bravo, you are not allowed to publicly advertise that you have an offering available. You can only present that to investors that are uh, having that have that have that prior existing relationship with you. Now, in a 506 Charlie, you can now inv um, invest marketing dollars to market your offering to people that you don't know. The only thing is, is that now in a 506 Charlie, you are unable to accept non-accredited investors. Now, you can do, still do unlimited amounts of accredited investors, but because you are now publicly advertising in the deal and you don't, and you and you might not have that prior existing relationship with them. The SEC requires all and all accredited investors in a 506 Charlie to go through a third-party accreditation process through a, pro, a service like VerifyInvestor.com or even having their uh, CPA or their attorney send in a document or a form that basically states that they are that they do meet the definitions of an accredited investor based on those guidelines. So. That's all I have for today. Those are the, the topics we wanted to talk about, how you can acquire money, how you can acquire assets with no money down by using other investors' capital. So I'm going to open it up right now for any questions that you might have. And we've already had a couple of them come through here. So I'm going to look through the chat box. If you have questions, I will go ahead and take some questions from you. For those of you who are joining us live, and for those of you who are not joining us live and you're watching the recording, you can go to multifamilyinvestornation.com and type your email in there to the box and you can join us for some of our future webinars that we will be doing. And next week, we actually do have another webinar um, ready to go. And I believe it's going to be Brandon Abbott on our team. He's going to be doing the next uh, uh, webinar and it's going to be our uh, we actually have a special guest coming on uh, next week. It's actually our transactional real estate attorney on how to negotiate a purchase and sale agreement for apartment syndication. syndication. So he's going to have a one-on-one -on -one live interview, Brandon is on our team, with Norm Prate. And he's going to be talking about how to negotiate a PSA. So make sure that you don't miss that. If you want to register for it, you can go to multifamilyinvestornation.com slash MFIN webinar. And then for those of you who are joining live, Melissa will type it into the chat box for you so you can participate with us um, on that next webinar and go ahead and get registered for it. So let me get the chat box up here and start reviewing some of these so you can see what we're looking at here. I know I had a, I think I had a question earlier on. So let me see if I can go through this list real quick and see if I have another question up here. Um, all right. Got a few spammers that try to spam me. Other than that, we're good. Um, that's why we have it so that uh, you guys can only chat with me as the panelists. So we don't have uh, people coming on here trying to spam the world with uh, uh, trying to poach, poach you guys and spam you on the chat box. Let's see. Uh, family office events. All right. Fuji water. All right. What are your thoughts on the educational programs like CCIM? So the CCIM program is a great, very well-known popular program that you could go through to learn more about underwriting and acquisitions and equity structures. And there's a lot of different things that you can do with that. So it's not something that I would say is a bad thing. It's just, it's not something that you need per, per se. Right. But if you want a little bit of a leg up on some of the knowledge and some of the education, 
great program to go through. It definitely is a, is a process. It's not one of those things you're going to take over a weekend and learn a lot. You're going to, it's one of those things that's going to be a process over multiple months, and sometimes people take years to complete that. And so that's that CCIM program. Um, but, but it's not a bad thing. I'm just saying that you don't necessarily need that in order to become an active multifamily syndicator. Next question in here is, can you briefly describe how you made the decision to buy your first multifamily and what stakes did, steps did you take all the way to closing? Well, that's a whole other podcast episode. So what we should do is, is this, uh, Melissa, jot down that topic right there and I will use that as a topic for one of our future webinars that we'll do over the next couple of months. So make sure you stay tuned for that. But briefly, what I'll talk to you about because I'll go into more detail about that because there's a lot of great information and stories about that acquisition. And that's one of those uh, types of webinars that we could actually do as a team um, on our group because there's lots of different nuances that came with that particular acquisition. So it's really kind of neat to talk about it. But the very first acquisition we had was an $8.9 million acquisition that we did on our own out of Greenville, South Carolina. We raised just over $2.5 million in equity on it. it. took us the full 60 days to raise the equity on that one. It was a lot of work, and it took us a lot of time to be able to raise the equity on that one. But it was our first one, right? We, we didn't have as, as much credibility as we have now with being able to produce the returns that we've been able to give for investors. And so that's uh, our very first acquisition. We actually <clears throat> found that deal through a broker. Once we started looking into multifamily and doing it on our own, we joined a couple other groups first to be able to acquire our first assets through and do it through JV partnerships. And then our very first own project that we did on our own was that project that I'm talking about out of Greenville, South Carolina. And that particular acquisition, we uh, sourced through a broker and made an offer on it thought we were going to be getting the deal and somebody outbid us by over $200,000. And so we couldn't go up by that much. And so we decided to pass on the deal and move on. Well, four weeks later, a broker called and said, the broker called and said, the original buyer backed out because they couldn't get to the point of even signing the PSA. And so the seller and the broker just decided to go away to part ways. And now it had fallen out of contract or not hadn't even gotten to the contract phase, but falling out. And so they wanted to know if we wanted the acquisition. And so we, we, we went ahead and went forward with it, bought the acquisition, closed it within 60 days and closed on that thing on December 15th, 2000. And I think it was either, you know, 17 or 18, somewhere around in there. But that particular acquisition was the first one that we did. And then the next year we, we closed like, I think like four or five more. And then we closed even more the next year and the next year. And last year we ended up, ended up raising over $61 million from our investors and acquired just over 156 million in acquisitions uh, in, in, in 2020, even in the middle of a pandemic year, right? And this year we're on par to even potentially double that as we add on some additional asset classes like self-storage as well. So I only have a few more minutes left here. And I know there's a bunch of questions that came in here. And maybe what I'll do is, is after the webinar today, I will shoot some videos to be able to, um, you know, record some short video clips uh, in the studio here to be able to share with you about uh, some of these questions that have come through. So I'll have Melissa and Don kind of save that chat, chat feed there so we can, you know, get some of those questions, be able to answer them a little bit further. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Alan is saying uh, that uh, I won't. Uh, I we, we he he has like he actually is receiving our monthly newsletter that we send out every month and says it's excellent. So we send out a monthly printed newsletter to our investors every single month that allows us to be able to continue to stay in, uh, in front of them and uh, provide some content with them as well. All right, let's see here. Do you need to be a licensed agent? Wondering how to transition to agent to investor syndicator. So, uh, hold on, I just missed my screen here. So you do not need to be a licensed agent to be able to do real estate syndication. I hold no real estate licenses at all whatsoever, but, uh, and so no, you don't have to have a license to do it yourself, right? So a lot of people think, oh, I need to go get my real estate agent's license or become a broker or something like that. And no, you don't necessarily need to do that at all. Again, just like the CCIM program, it's not going to be something that's going to be detrimental to you. So it'll be a good educational process and get to you, get you to have some a little bit more education in your background. And maybe in the beginning, build you some more additional credibility, right? But at the end of the day, 
um, these 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 types of apartments that you're buy, we're buying these large 150 units or more are properties that are really businesses. They're operated as a business, and we're buying the business. And when we buy the business, we're buying it with cash flow day one, right? And what, what we have, but you have to know how to run a business, right? I'd rather you, I'd rather you have an MBA than a CCIM because you're running a business. You have to know how to run a business in order to succeed in apartment syndication. So you have to know how to manage people. You have to know how to manage processes. You know you have to know how to put in systems in place. You have to manage a business this like a business. And if you're not going to do that, then you shouldn't get into it. This is truly a business that you are starting. So if you think you're just going to sit on your hands and do nothing all day long and have this great financial freedom, that's not what this business is all about right? Now, yes, you can have financial freedom and in this business, but the biggest thing that I like to look at is not just financial freedom, but freedom for my time, right? I want to have the flexibility to be able to do what I want to do, go wherever I want to go, and to be able to spend time with my family wherever I am. And that to me is, is true financial freedom is being able to be able to have the flexibility of being able to do that, right? Well, that's all the questions that I have for today that I can, I can answer. I know several of you have already typed in some additional questions. So if you want, if you have a question and you want me to shoot a video response to it, I'll post it up on our LinkedIn channel. So if you want to link with me on LinkedIn, you can go over there, go to linkwithdan.com and that'll link you straight over to my profile. That's all it does. It's an easy link, linkwithdan.com. Go over to my profile on LinkedIn, connect with me and we'll post some responses on LinkedIn um, from, from some of the questions that have come in through here. So if you don't already have a LinkedIn profile, make sure you go get one, but you can go to linkwithdan.com and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. And then we'll post some additional responses to some of these questions on LinkedIn as well. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Looking forward to having you at the summit coming up in June. You can go to mfinsummit.com to register for that. And then also look forward to having you on the next webinar. So just go to multifamily investor webinar, excuse me, multifamilyinvestornation.com slash MFIN webinar to be able to join us for the next webinar. So thank you for being with us. Look forward to seeing you back here next week. <laughs>